God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from the grave. My God still rolling him away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. My God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Good morning. Welcome to St. Mark's. Surely there is joy in the house of the Lord today. Uh, whether you are feeling that joy or not, we welcome you this morning and we pray that this is a time of joy and rejuvenation for the coming week as we open our hearts in worship and, and lift our lives to God today. Let's stand and sing together our first song, Sing, Sing, Sing.
as we quiet our hearts and sing Shout to the Lord. Yay. I heard that. Yay. <laughs> well, good morning. 
Isn't it a beautiful day to be in God's house? Yes, it is. Well, I would like to ask you all to join with me in praying our breakthrough prayer as we get started this morning. Let's pray. God of abundance, open our hearts and minds this season and always. Transform and send us into the world, growing in your spirit to cultivate your love and grace with boldness. Amen. Y'all may be seated, except for Jen and Jackie, who are coming up to share some very good specialness with us today. Number one. Start the celebration with a short video. Bibles to third graders for many years, and it's a good time to remember that these third graders are the future of our church. We pray our church is regularly letting them know how special they are and that they find joy in spiritual growth in our programming here at St. Mark's. So this morning, we are excited to give Bibles donated by our United Women in Faith to the third graders of our congregation. And at this time, I want to invite um, the UWF representatives who are going to be handing out the Bibles. Thank you, ladies. And third graders, as you hear your name called, please come forward and remain standing up front. You can stand up right here um, facing the congregation. And after all the Bibles have been presented, the pastor will offer a word of prayer over you. Jace Beagle, Ramsey Blake, Nicholas Bridenstine, Jesse Brinkman, Adeline Burton, Jacob Dobson, Lizzie Geis, Sam Harbeck, Charlie Kelly, Corinne Melvin, Samuel Powers, and Natalie Taylor. Okay, we can give them all a round of applause. <laughs> All right. Friends, this is the future of our church that are standing before you today, and I just ask you to join with me in a quick word of blessing over them this morning. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your presence here among our students and their families, and we ask that you pour your blessings out over them and show them good use of the tools that they have been given. We ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you. Let's sit back down. Yeah, that's fine. I had to check my notes. Sorry about that. All right. Well... <laughs> I would like to invite you all at this time as our students make their way back to their seats to say congratulations to them and say hello to your neighbors and maybe meet a new friend on the other side of the uh, sanctuary this morning. Let's pass the peace of Christ.
Is it me, or do you also tend to have a case of the Mondays after today? <laughs> I'm Ryan Howe, and let's get to announcements here at The Current. Maybe this year I'll finally be able to get a pumpkin. It seems like every time I go to a pumpkin patch, I end up with a rock. <laughs> and if you would like to get a pumpkin, please note the Cornerstone Pumpkin Patch will be available beginning October 9th. Yes, St. Mark's Youth will be selling pumpkins beginning October 9th. Profits will go to sponsor youth fees for work camp, mission camps, and retreats. Pricing and details will be coming soon. There is a timeout for MOPS, which means MOPS has two left to use before the end of the first half. <laughs> if you are a St. Mark's mother of preschoolers or MOPS, just a reminder that they are meeting September 21st from 9.30 to 11.15 a.m. Our MOPS group meets two Thursdays a month for fellowship and learning with children's programming available for infants six plus months old and preschoolers. There are also monthly MOPS Moms Night Out events. Try saying that fast three times. Monthly MOPS Moms Night Out events and family play dates. To learn more, visit M-O-P-S-A-T St. Marks at gmail.com. Whoever told me this was a potato plant obviously lied to me. Anyway, we just wanted to make you aware that the Mission in Action Day and Potato Drop are occurring October 21st and 22nd. So please join us for Mission in Action Day, our annual day of actively living out our motto, where mission is a way of life. We will worship through serving, working as the hands and feet of Jesus. Mission opportunities include the potato drop on Saturday, October 21st, then on Sunday, October 27th, mission projects both on-site and off-site. Go to stmarkscarmel.org slash MIA day to learn more and to sign up. Don't forget to wear your St. Mark's t-shirt as well. I tell you what, these potato plants shed like crazy. At this time, I would like to welcome all guests to St. Mark's Church. Also, if you're live and attention with us, please feel free to scan the QR codes found in your bulletin or fill out the blue books at the end of your pew. In addition, whether or not you are worshiping with us either live or through the magic of streaming, you can also go to stmarkscarmel.org slash attend to rest your attendance that way. And now, let's get back to worshiping here at The Current. Thanks, Ryan. I have to give just one more little plug for the announcement um, that you'll find in the bulletin and you've seen on some of the slides about our upcoming Holy Land trip. Uh, I'll, I will be leading a group from St. Mark's and elsewhere uh, to the Holy Land next spring, and it's going to be a fantastic time. So if there is uh, some desire in your heart to be able to walk where Jesus walked and go along with us, um, please let me know or take a look at the information that you can find in the bulletin or on the website. I'm really excited about it, so I hope we have a, a whole bus that we fill with St. Markers to go on this trip. Who's familiar with Edie Falco? Name sound familiar? She's known for her roles in The Sopranos and Nurse Jackie. 
but she took center stage as Tommy, as LAPD's inaugural female chief of police just weeks into 2020. Now, if you missed the show, don't worry, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, it only lasted one season. However, during that season, Falco's character held the reins. And I've got to tell you, I really kind of liked seeing a powerful woman at the helm of one of the world's largest police forces in that show. It really is worth binge watching since you know you've only got the one season to watch. Now, of course, it's, it's no longer groundbreaking to see female protagonists, be they detectives or leaders on TV. But back in 1974, if we rewind to 74, I, I remember seeing Angie Dickinson starring as a policewoman on Police Woman. And it was quite an anomaly at the time. Now, over the years, there were more sh uh, shows that spotlighted female detectives. We have people like Kira Sedgwick in The Closer, and the dynamic duo of Tyne Daly and Sharon Gless in Cagney and Lacey, and Robin Tooney in The Mentalist. There's Stana Caddick in Castle. The list just continued to grow. Now, films, of course, haven't been left far behind either, with powerful female leads shining in movies like Aaron Brockovich, Hidden Figures, The Hunger Games, and even 2019's Captain Marvel. Now, although Brie Larson as Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, arguably ushered us into a new era of female-led superhero movies, there is little debate who historically has been considered the most iconic of female superheroes. What do you think? Wonder Woman! Wonder Woman leapt from the comic book pages onto the small screen as a television series back in 1975 with Linda Carter as that celebrated superhero. Remember the, the bracelets and the tiara? Yeah. The role was reprised by Gal Gadot in Wonder Woman Rise of the Warrior in 2017. And at the time, that film earned the title of highest grossing superhero origin film of all time. Now, of course, every superhero needs their super weapons, and Wonder Woman was no exception. Her, her arsenal of superpowers included that lasso of truth, her magic bracelets that can deflect obstacles, including bullets. Now, who else did this all the time with their friends? Come on. And that royal tiara, it could become a projectile when needed to be. She was absolutely iconic, but not the first. The, the amazing warrior from Themyscira debuted October of 1941 in the All-Star comics before making her way over to the DC universe. But depending on whose list that you're reading, there were as many as a dozen that preceded Diana Prince's first appearance in those comics. There was Fantoma, who debuted in February of 1940 in the Jungle Comics. She has superhuman abilities combined with telekinesis and an ability to transform into a monster. Fantoma protected the forests in Africa against evil. Now, making her first appearance in the world of Captain America in December of 1940, Elizabeth Betsy Ross started out as a government agent working in World War II before she decided to put on a costume herself and become the Golden Girl. Now, during this time, we also had figures such as Claire Voyant, Miss Fury, Phantom Lady, Black Cat, and possibly the first DC Comics vigilante, Red Tornado. Now, Red Tornado had a son who was obsessed with Green Lantern, and she wanted to be an inspiration for him. So she donned a very peculiar suit with a cooking pot as a helmet. It was 1940, so I am choosing to withhold comment on that one. <laughs> Uh, these surely were great characters in their time, 
And we've seen some great characters in the 80-some years since then. The truth is they, they capture our admiration. They stand up against oppressive forces, using their power in position to bring about justice. Yet, just as inspiring as these fictional characters might be, there is a real-life Wonder Woman in our very own sacred texts. Esther, today's hero of our faith. Like the modern-day Wonder Women that we celebrate on screen, Esther wasn't just handed power. She had to navigate complex dynamics, personal risks, and moral decisions. She wasn't fighting with a shield or a sword, but her courage, her voice, and a deep sense of responsibility. Now, in a palace filled with intrigues, power struggles, and threats, Esther chose to risk it all. Why? To ensure justice for her people, the Israelites. So if you're not familiar with Esther's story, you're going to want to go home and grab some popcorn and settle in with your favorite Bible because the book of Esther reads like a made-for-TV movie. In it, we find suspense, intrigue, betrayal, conspiracy, and treachery. The cast of characters includes a king, a queen that loses her throne, an orphan girl who becomes queen and saves the day, a man of God, and of course a villain. So let's recap Esther for you here real quick. The story takes place in the 5th century BC, most likely around the 470s or so. And this was a, a period after Persia had replaced Babylon as the ruling power, and the Jews were living in exile. Xerxes I, known as Xerxes the Great, was the king in Persia. At the time, you could have called him king of the world and wouldn't have been far off. He invaded Greece in 480, and he became a monarch with absolute power and authority. Now, in the Bible, he's known as Ahasuerus, but we're talking about the same uber-powerful king. So our story begins, innocently enough, with Ahasuerus throwing a massive party that went on for more than a week. By the seventh day, the king and his guests had been imbibing a lot. In fact, we're, in told, in, we're told in Esther 1.8 that they were drinking by flagons without restraint. And I don't know about you all, but I had to look up flagon. One flagon was equal to about three bottles. So regardless of how it adds up, it was a lot. <laughs> now the king, who was described as being merry with wine ordered his queen, Vashti, to come out and display her beauty in her royal crown before her, his guests. Now, even two and a half millennia ago, women didn't really relish the idea of being paraded around like trophies, so Vashti put her foot down and said no. But this, of course, didn't sit well with the king, and he sought counsel. His advisors suggested finding a new queen, which led to a kingdom-wide beauty contest. I get a picture of a really old bachelor um, show in my head when I'm thinking about this. Because you see, young women from all over the country would vie for a chance to become queen. They'd go through a preliminary screening process looking for the most beautiful to be groomed and pampered for several months, and then each one would spend some time with the king, and he, in turn, would choose his new queen. Tell me that's not where the bachelor came from. <laughs> so the edict went out, and the process began. Enter Esther, a Jewish orphan raised by her cousin Mordecai. With her charm and beauty, she won over the king and earned her place as queen, though she had to keep her Jewish heritage a secret. Now, Mordecai, always keeping an eye on his dear cousin, discovered a plot to assassinate the king. He relayed this to Esther, who in turn informed the king, saving his life. And while this heroic act went unnoticed for a moment, it became super important later on. So just hold that one. Now, enter Haman, 
the story's villain. He climbed the political ladder to become the king's right-hand man. And when Mordecai refused to bow to him, Haman's ego took a hit. Now, instead of just getting back at Mordecai, Haman decided to target the entire Jewish community. He got the king's approval to send out a decree, which we hear about in Esther 3.13. It says, Fast runners were to take the order to all the provinces of the king. The order commanded people to wipe out, kill, and destroy all the Jews, both young and old, even women and little children. This was to happen in a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, that is the month of Adar. They were also to seize all of their property. Yikes, right? One day to wipe out an entirety of people. Now, this terrifying decree spurs a series of desperate and courageous acts. Mordecai implores, implores Esther to use her position to save her people, urging her to think beyond her own safety and reminding her of Haman's intention to destroy all of the Jewish people. Now, the pivotal moment in this story for Esther is captured in Esther 4, 13 through 17, where we hear, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But if you and your father, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish... I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So embodying bravery and self-sacrifice, Esther chooses to act, initiating a fast and preparing to approach the king unsummoned, a move that could potentially result in her death. As she steps forward with her plea to save her people, a series of dramatic and somewhat serendipitous events unfold, including the king's sudden desire to honor Mordecai for previously saving his life, and Haman's concurrent building of a gallows intended for Mordecai. Now, Esther tactfully reveals her Jewish identity and Haman's diabolical plot during a banquet that she throws for the king. This leads to a reversal of fortunes, with Haman being executed on the very gallows that he had built for Mordecai. Esther then asks the king to overrule the edict that Haman had issued to destroy all the Jews. Now the king happily agrees and issues a new royal edict that all of the Jews throughout Persia were to be protected. Esther continues to find favor with the king. Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom. And all of the Jews in every region throughout Persia celebrated. And they still celebrate today. They celebrate this story during the Feast of Purim. So, there you have it. There's Esther's story in its entirety. Rich with intrigue, suspense, romance, and even some moral guidance that could flow through into our lives today. But here's something that gets me about this book. God doesn't appear directly in the book of Esther at all. God isn't even mentioned. Not strength through God or faith in God. But there is absolutely no doubt 
that God's presence is felt throughout every single page. It's as if God is, is whispering in the background, weaving a tapestry that none of them could fully comprehend at that moment. Now we see in, in Esther's story a truth that we have seen with each of our heroes in this series. God is using the right person or the right people to bring about God's plans. Now with Esther, we see that God is using the, the right person to bring about God's justice, even if the world or, or Esther herself may not have seen it that way at the time. Those words, it might just be for such a time as this. Now Esther held her Jewish identity and, and became the queen to the Persian king. Haman, the, the king's advisor, made an edict to kill the entire Jewish population. Mordecai, Esther's uncle, challenges her to speak to the king on behalf of her Jewish people. God is calling Esther to use her privilege and her position courageously. You see, for, for her to approach the king unrequested, the punishment for anybody who did that was death. She does it anyway. And she pleads for her people's lives. And the king grants her wish to her and then ultimately has the villain executed. Now, you see, we, we also see in Esther's story a confirmation for us that nothing stops God. Certainly not a human edict. The edict was, was understood to be an all-encompassing final law. It was given with absolute human authority, and yet God clears a different path through God's people. Now with Esther, we see again that God's people will not be destroyed. Like the Israelites that we heard about under Deborah's care, the spies that were under Rahab's care, the church that was under Lydia's care, God continues and will continue to work for the salvation of God's people. God continues to take seemingly hopeless situations and brings hope into and out of each of them. You see, Esther's courage came from understanding the moment that she was in and her power to make a difference in such a time as this. She was truly a wonder woman at a time when most powerful authorities in the world stood against her and her people. But she dared to go before the king and speak the truth. She was open to where God was leading her, and she was willing to take the risks that she needed to take in order to be an agent of change for all of Israel. Now, without the, the lasso of truth or, or magic bracelets, she found a way to speak the truth and to dodge the enemies that she had coming at her. Esther used her position and her voice to protect her people during a critical time in history. Now, much like Esther, each of us is positioned in unique places of influence. Whether we, we find those places among our families, our workplaces, or our communities, we all have a voice that can advocate for justice and change. So this morning, I ask you all to reflect. Who or what is your Esther moment? Which group of God's people or, or which justice issue makes your spirit restless? 
Now, maybe for some, it's, it's advocating for women's rights or champion educa- championing education or standing up for our environment. Maybe it's visiting those in prison, serving those who are without food and shelter. The very restlessness that you're feeling might just be God nudging you to rise and to act. So as we we leave this space today and, and we head into our coming week, I'd like for everyone to consider what is one small step, no matter how small that happens to be, that you can take using your unique position, your unique voice, your unique skills to advocate for justice in our community or in our world. Because the truth is, thanks to God, within each of us lies an Esther that is waiting to go out there and to make a difference. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to enter into our, our time of, of prayer now, and as is our custom here, we'll begin with a moment of, of silent reflection with everybody where we can use this time listening to the, the special music that we have from our worship team today to lift our joys and concerns to God this morning. We can use this time to to prepare our tithes and our offerings. Um, They can be left in the baskets at the back of the sanctuary or, of course, online through the QR codes or the links that are published in your bulletin. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've been sharing some thoughts on why we give financial offerings to the church. For today, I want us to, to understand that when we give, we help create a space where the Holy Spirit can do good work in the lives of people and places where we may not otherwise be able to reach alone. There are places that our financial offerings go to that our physical bodies simply cannot go. As part of our worldwide connection that is the United Methodist Church, a portion of everything that we give goes to fund schools around the world support missions to those most in need, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and to support the sick. So this morning, I invite you to give courageously, knowing that the gift of, yes, your your finances, but also your time and your talent, supports the work of the kingdom that is being built right here on earth. And may God multiply all of our gifts, that they might turn into ministry opportunities to lift up the lowly, to empower the oppressed, and to share God's light and God's love around the world. can see the waters raging at my feet I can feel the breath of those surrounding me I can hear the sound of nations rising up we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome I can walk down the dark and painful road I can face Every fear of the unknown I can hear All God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome The same power that rose Jesus from the grave The same power that commands the dead to wake Lives in us lives in us the same power that moves mountains when he speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in 
in us. He lives in us. Lives in us. We have hope that His promises are true in His strength. There is nothing we can do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us. Lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when He speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us. He lives in us. He lives in us. Lives in us. Greater is He that is living in me. He's conquered our enemy. Would you all join me in prayer? Gracious God, who moves in every heartbeat and moment, we come before you with spirits attuned to your call and hands ready to shape a world of justice and love. In the tapestry of sacred stories, we find lessons of those who in their unique moments, rose up to act for the sake of others. In quiet whispers and bold actions, they embodied your heart for justice, reminding us of our own roles in this world. For aren't we all placed by design or serendipity for such times as these? God of many faces and names, we see reflected in our own stories the courage of countless souls who've gone before us. Every individual who has faced the tides of adversity, fortified by your ever-present love. Let their resolve inspire our own, kindling a fire within to dismantle injustice and champion compassion in every corner. Forgive us, God, for the times our courage wavered. Our voices went silent, and our actions hesitated. Yet in your vast grace, you gently nudge us back, reminding us of the profound call to love and serve. And as we navigate this journey, emboldened by tales of faith and valor, may we be torchbearers of your light, continuously seeking guidance in our efforts to co-create a world echoing with your ideals of equity and love. God, who understands the depths of our hearts, strengthen our resolve to be 
agents of change, allowing your love to guide our paths and listening keenly to the hopes and hurts of your beloved community. As we stand united, a community bound by faith and propelled by a shared commitment to justice and love, let's join our voices as one. In the words taught to us by Jesus, who exemplified the path of love and courage and justice, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And I'd like to invite you all once again to stand as you're led and able to join us in our closing song today. Great. I search the world, but it couldn't fill. that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's no As the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Beauty to ashes 
As Esther was called for such a time as this, so too are each of us. May we leave this place with courage in our hearts, and may God, who guides us through every chapter of our lives, strengthen our resolve to stand for justice, kindness, and love. Let's go change the world. Amen.